All right, we're going to bring uh, our next uh, panel up on stage. And I'd like you all to come. This is a, a huge group of folks, so uh, I'm going to have them all come up and introduce themselves, because it will be a 10-minute monologue uh, if I do it. So why don't we have, I think there they are, come on up, uh, panelists. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, investment startups uh, in uh, the open source world. Hey, welcome. And uh, you know, again, on that flywheel that I presented on Monday, or a Tuesday, we have this open source projects that beget uh, commercial products and services, that beget value and profit, that provide for a reinvestment back into the project, better code, more products, more features, more value, more reinvestment. Uh, and these folks uh, are the ones that are making that happen in terms of making investment decisions, in terms of uh, being entrepreneurs, uh, and so forth. So I'm going to start at uh, that end. And if you could each uh, introduce yourselves uh, quickly and Very go quickly. down there. Hi, folks. My name is uh, Sirish Raghuram. I'm co-founder and CEO at Platform9. Platform9, uh, I hope you're listening to what Subhu just said in the previous panel. Running open source at scale is hard. That's the problem Platform9 solves. We deliver open source cloud frameworks as a service. So the idea is you get the time to value and simplicity of operations of the cloud, but while using pure play open source frameworks like OpenStack, Kubernetes, and uh, Fission for serverless. Hi, my name is Gary Little. Um, I'm with the uh, co-founder of Canvas Ventures. I've been in venture for about 20 years uh, with Morgan Thaler Ventures and now uh, Canvas. We're Series A, B. Um, over that time, I've invested in four open source related uh, companies, uh, Jaspersoft, MuleSoft, Sonatype, and Platform9, uh, and um, have drawn some observations from those investments. Great. Hey, hi, my name is Edith Levin. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, my name is Edith Levin. I'm the founder and the CEO of uh, Solo.io. Uh, we just started. Um, the idea with the Solio, what we're trying to do is basically gluing the environment of monolithic microservices and serverless environment by cutting all the infrastructure for function and basically assemble application that we're calling hybrid app and basically give a cohesive uh, way. And we started, we just launched and open source it the day before yesterday. So, Congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, Rashmi Gopinath. I'm a partner with Microsoft Ventures with the corporate venturing arm for Microsoft. We typically invest in Series A through C stage companies um, across the board on enterprise software. So cloud infrastructure, AI, ML, cybersecurity, DevOps, IoT, pretty long list. I have invested um, in MongoDB when I was at Intel Capital prior to this. I was also partly associated with the cloud era investment that Intel did. Worked for an open source startup um, at Couchbase and have invested in one open source uh, networking company at Microsoft, so have some familiarity with the space as well. Terrific. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Goldfein, and uh, happy International Women's Day, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm a partner at Zeta Venture Partners, which is an early stage VC firm that invests in enterprise startups that solve problems with big data and AI, and we, um, we particularly like to invest in data infrastructure and, and see a lot of open source in that direction. Um, before I joined Zeta, I spent my whole career as an engineer, notably with long stints, both at VMware and Facebook, and while those were companies that mostly uh, built proprietary software, we also released a lot of open source, um, and I got to be the champion for a number of those projects. Hi, everyone. My name is Jake Flumenberg. I'm a partner at Excel. Excel is a global venture capital firm that does a little bit of everything in consumer and enterprise from seed through growth. Um, but we've done over a dozen open source investments over the years. And I also worked at uh, Cloudera uh, in the very early days. Welcome. I'm Erica Brescia. I'm the co-founder and COO of a company called Bitnami that is uh, mostly known for delivering a catalog of over 150 open source apps on all of the major cloud platforms. Um, we're also very active in the open source community and Kubernetes in particular. I've been in and around open source since 2005. Um, I'm also an investment partner with X Factor Ventures, which is a seed fund that is investing in companies with at least uh, one female founder that is spun out of Flybridge. And I have the honor of serving as an at-large director on the Linux Foundation board. So I think I have 
three different ways to look at the open source investment um, discussion. That is very true. And I can't help but say this because it's not just International Women's Day, it is also Erica's birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Yay for a panel on my birthday. Thank you, Jim. I am so flattered that you are here for this panel. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I want to start uh, on the investor side uh, here and ask uh, some of the investors that are up on the panel. You know, um, when the original sort of open source startup uh, phase came in, you know, we talked Tuesday about how it was all about commoditizing mm -hmm. uh, markets. And, you know, I think that over a long period of time, what you would hear is like, oh, can there ever be another red hat? And are we naturally capping the size of these firms based on, you know, just taking a big market, making it smaller, and that TAM is all we're going to get? Uh, how, how has the investment thesis around open source startups, in, in your experience over time, changed? What, what, what are you seeing today are, are, are effective? I think, Rashmi, I'll start with you and then go over to Gary and then come over here uh, to the folks from Excel. Sure. So we've seen it go a little bit, I would say, in a wave pattern. So I would say back in 2010, 2011, there was definitely a lot of appetite for investments which kind of dipped a little bit, I would say, in 2015, 2016, and then we saw things coming back again. Um, at, I mean, at least from the, the investors and folks that I work with, there's definitely a lot of interest in evaluating and investing in open source startups. If you look at the exit path for some of the recent exits that companies have had, either in the public market or as an acquisition, it has proven to be pretty good, I would say. Mm. So Microsoft acquired Xamarin and Deus. Those were pretty good multiples uh, for those acquiring companies. Um, Mongo, Cloudera all went IPO recently, and they're doing pretty well so far on the public market, too. Um, CoreOS got bought by Red Hat at a pretty good multiple uh, for the company. And so we're definitely seeing these exits as signs that um, there is good appetite for the acquirers as well as for the public markets, um, depending on, I mean, the value proposition that these companies have and what they have to offer. Even in terms of the investment activity, um, if you look at, I mean, recent investments by Redis or Databricks, there's definitely um, good appetite from the investment committee uh, community in being able to fund these companies. Yeah, yeah. Jocelyn, what are you seeing? Well. You know, I feel like just as in the Red Hat days, there was this idea that, I, I mean, I think VCs are always concerned with monetization and how you're going to monetize something that, that fundamentally is free. And I think that, you know, sort of Red Hat was the only one who seemed to seriously make a go of, well, the software is free, but we'll sell support. And then I think the cloud came along and there was this idea of, okay, maybe hosting is an alternative path. The software is free, but we'll host it and make money that way. And I think we also have yet to see really big successes come there. Mm. But I think where we have seen big successes, I'll, certainly um, Rashmi named a bunch of good ones, but one I'll point to is GitHub, mm -hmm. where they're killing it on the monetization side, selling mm. an enterprise product with an enterprise feature set with a free open source version that does not in the least feel artificially crippled or, or constrained by its user base. And so I think to me, the GitHub <coughs> model is the really exciting, inspiring one which is, can you identify a proprietary business model on top of a foundation that's free and open source and not, that's not crippleware? Yeah. Gary, I want to go to you and then come over to Jake. What, yeah, what do sure. you think? So I think your, your, your question is, how's, it, how's the investor's view changed over time? Right. And I mentioned I made four open source related investments. And two of those that have exited, I think, are good point counterpoints. Um, uh, the first one, 2002, was. Uh, was Jaspersoft. Um, it got acquired 10 years later. Actually, um, it was 2004 we acquired Jasper Reports. It, it uh, 10 years later, was sold to Tibco for $185 million. Mm -hmm. The second one was 2006. Again, um, two founders backed them. And uh, 11 years later, IPO, and that company has a uh, market cap of about $4.5 billion now. Um, both had great teams. Uh, both had really good investors, multiple rounds. And um, so uh, what made them different? I think we got into both of those investments thinking, hey, with open source, we can provide 80% of the functionality for 20% of the price, take a $10 billion total market, cram it down to $3 billion, and, be, and win the lion's share of it. I mean, that was kind of the open source um, right. um, uh, thought there. Mark Mikos used to say that about MySQL for the sure. database market. Um, I think what we found was, um, you know, the people who love open source are developers. 
developers um, don't have money, and if they have money, they don't want to spend it. Um, but open source is great for uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, being distributed in viral growth within the developer community. Uh, what makes a better business model, and GitHub is a good example, is when you're actually, even though you're getting developer adoption, you're actually monetizing at a different layer. So in the case of Jaspersoft, its market was selling to developers, and their number one competitor, they became the most widely used reporting solution, their number one competitor was indeed um, the, free, the free version. It was good enough, um, and, um, and so that limited this opportunity. Uh, MuleSoft, which was an enterprise service bus, touched um, thousands of servers, thousands of applications. There's really no way you'd go live without having a relationship with the company, and not only a relationship with service, but you better have the bells and whistles with uh, the management console and the reporting and, and everything that goes into it. isn't a, managing all those APIs easy? Um, <laughs> so, so the value is monetized at the IT ops and, right. um, and, and that layer, and they would pay good money to keep those um, uh, companies up and going and have visibility when there was a problem. That kind of got them from maybe the 18K uh, up to the six-figure deals, but still a six-figure deal. What got them into the seven-figure and eight-figure per year deals was um, uh, when they um, actually got up to the C-suite. And so um, it went from operational at the IT ops level to strategic, and then they were selling digital transformation and agility of changing business models. That's when they got up to seven figure and they announced they have, at the last earnings announcement, 45 customers paying them a million dollars per year or, or more. So that, that's been my lessons. I think open source as a business model, great for adoption, really poor for monetization, unless you're monetizing at diff different levels. Yeah. So Jake, I saved you for last because uh, you know, Ping Lee spoke uh, at this event last year. I, I would add that I saw the Deus and Microsoft people talking in the corner at this event a lot <laughs> last year. Uh -huh. And then oddly, right after uh, certain announcements made, but uh, Jake, you know, you, you down at Excel, you guys have done a lot of work analyzing uh, this concept of you know projects, and then the transition to getting customer requirements, productization, and looked at like the balance sheets across a pretty wide portfolio that you have, like share some of the insights that you see that you know, you're looking for in these firms in terms of you know, where efficiencies gain, like what is open source? Sure, um, you know, so I'd, I'd make one, one passing comment and, and I, I sort of think success uh, in, a, in a sense will be when we stop talking about open source business model. Like, what it, like we don't talk about <laughs> proprietary business model. Like, what is open source? Open source is a development model. And, and, and so we, we lump so many things into this bucket. And, and maybe just a few data points. It, back um, before circa two, 2005, it was two to $300 million go of like private venture capital going in um, into open source companies. If you look past the uh, past four or five years, over a billion, pretty steady, steadily. You could argue that maybe there's a dip, but it's just a couple of these mega pre-IPO rounds that sort of skew things. Um, you've gone from two to three um, publicly traded open source companies to a steady cadence, uh, depending on where you draw the line of what is an actual open source company, sure. um, entering the, the IPO pipeline. So a lot more public market um, liquidity. And, and you've gone from a world where a lot of things were monolith and siloed and worked on a single node to a world in which things are inherently more distributed and therefore more complicated to operate, which is a much better, I think, substrate for, for building a business. You've gone to a world now where there's this sort of as, uh, as a service issue and dimension to the, the thoughts around um, monetization. Um, but, but I mean, like if I had to sort of summarize that is, and, and I don't know if this is true at the application layer yet, but certainly at the infrastructure layer, we've gone from a world where open source is the exception to open source is, is the rule. Like, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there's probably at least two dozen venture firms that invest a lot in open source now. And like, I bet the, the, all those guys, ourselves included, would sort of ask yourself a question. If you're building another database, it's like, not why would it be open source, it's sort of why would it? And I think that's a fundamental change over the past decade. Mm. In terms of the way we look um, at these startups, we break it into what we call this 3P framework. 
project, product, profit. Right. Um, and, and simply what that means is if you can't build a project that people care about in a truly meaningful way and deploy in a mission critical use case, who cares, right? Like just like it's not relevant to us. Um, and there's lots of wonderful open source where the, where the goal is not necessarily that. But if you can deploy in a, you know, a big meaningful mission critical way, um, you sort of achieve that, that first milestone. And then the next question becomes um, like what's the product? What are the bounds of what's free? What's the bounds of what's not? There's some things that are really simple on the security and maybe authentication side where there's never been a case in the world where you throw that out to the open source community and someone raises their hand and say, hey, I'd love to build that. On average, that doesn't happen. Mm. That are easy. There's other things that are much more complicated. Do you hold back the distributed version or not? Do you only do the SaaS version and not have the enterprise version? And I don't think there's a lot of good answers, but I do think um, that we're seeing a lot more innovative business models now than support and services, right? Mm -hmm. um, and support and services just, on average, won't give you the margin structure to reinvest and continually um, uh, you know, build more into the business. Um, and open source has been a great tailwind, marketing in a sense, for adoption. And the, you, you change from these sort of hunters to go find people to, to, to maybe farmers. How do, you, how do you tease out from that open source community who is going to be a free user, who's going to be a $50,000 user, who has the potential to be a seven-figure user over time? And those are the sorts of things we study um, you know, as, as we look to invest in these companies. I want to ask you one question, then move on to the entrepreneurs here, because you know you, you mentioned about you know where it, it, it's sort of the norm. You just look at it as a company. Open source is sort of the norm at this point. But uh, these efficiencies around marketing and culling through the big uh, amount of interest that will come in through an open source project that sort of goes viral. Are you seeing that reflected in the actual balance sheets? Like the, the entrepreneurs are listening here. Like, is marketing going to go? Is it going to be cheaper? Is it going to be more expensive? Is R&D going to go down? Is R&D going to go up? Like, yeah, what are you I, seeing I, on the I balance mean, sheet? If, if I had to say, I would, I would almost argue that R&D is a little higher and marketing is a little lower on most open source companies compared to our traditional enterprise. There's sometimes you, there, there are economies of, of, of having a big community participate. Sometimes there's governance challenges. Sometimes things are harder, harder to, to, to move forward. But you, know, you go from this, um, there, there's a huge difference in qualification um, from someone that has never heard of your product to someone that's using it. And we sort of call this TAC. Who, like, what's your total addressable community? And like, what's the process of converting um, you know, that active community member into a, a, a paid customer? And if that activation energy isn't actually cheaper than a traditional sales cycle by some margin, um, uh, you, you've broken something. So, so you, have, you, you have firms that are actually measuring the uh, acquisition at the project level from a financial sense? Uh, I, I think, it, you know, I, I would call it in the early days aspirational, but when you get to scale, when you're on that path from, you know, 20 million ARR up to w what it takes to become public, you absolutely uh, have to measure it. And, and, it, and it's so, you know, these big deals can, can change the dynamics, but um, it, it's really a question of not holding them to a bar, uh, maybe in that very early stage, but get in the habit. Uh, of measurement, like what is the metric that is actually meaningful, and having the conversation with the entrepreneurs to define those metrics up front, and so you can do whatever you want for now, but like you know, gosh, you're going to have to you're going to have to achieve these sorts of efficiencies. Um, what are the open source metrics that you might look for as a public market investor? But but also, oh by the way, like if you don't hit all the normal traditional enterprise software metrics, that like you're not going to get you know you're not going to be rewarded by the public markets anyway. Yeah. Hey, Jim, I mean, sorry, can I make a comment yeah, on please, that data please. point? I think I just had this conversation with a successful open source founder who exited, who I won't name because he didn't give me permission. But we were talking about Was their... It recent? <laughs> <laughs> Not going to answer that either. But uh, he just told me, like, we suck at marketing, and so we put our money in, in R&D, and that's, yeah. our, that's part of our go-to-market strategy. And they were literally looking at this trade-off. Like, we're not going to invest in marketing. We're going to invest a whole lot in the open source and building an ecosystem and a community and using that as the driver for adoption and visibility, and it clearly worked out quite well. So. It's definitely counterintuitive, though, because you always think of this great shared R&D effort out there, but you're telling me on your balance sheets you're seeing actually higher R&D. Yes. The big value is in the marketing, which I think is super interesting. I want to go to the entrepreneurs now because uh, one thing that I do think, in addition to marketing efficiency, that I want to ask you all about just in your fundraising experience, and in, in a prior life I did rounds of fundraising and, and uh, pitched a lot of venture uh, firms in the Valley. It, is the open source uh, component of your business or the fact that you should hang your hat on being an open source company, is at least a 
fundraising efficiency that you're getting out of it is, is uh, clearly on the Excel side. They're, they don't care either way. So he's, he's, Jake's been very clear on that. But uh, do you see that as you're going around and, and pitching different firms? All, you know, Eric, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, no, so no, <laughs> well, no, we're we're bootstrapped. So I mean, but Nami's oh. in an interesting uh, position there. But I'm also an investor, and I will tell yeah. you, no, like I, I do expect, like Jake said, and I think maybe Jocelyn mentioned, like almost every company has some aspect of open source in their strategy, at least in the software space now. Like they're 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 either using or building around open source. Like look at the Kubernetes ecosystem, for example where companies are investing heavily there and then building products around it and networking and But, but does the halo of like no. Kubernetes <laughs> help oh. you to yeah. raise money? Because there's been a lot of announcements of Kubernetes-based startups raising some pretty big rounds. But that's not uh, because... Jake there, I'm <laughs> looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> but I would, I would say that's not necessarily because it's open source. By definition, I would say it's because it's popular and it has a ton of momentum. Okay. And it achieved that, of course, because it's open source. But somebody doesn't come, at least to me, and say, hey, I'm running an open source company, and I'm like, holy cow, I want to invest in that company because they're in open source, right? It's yeah. because they're in a hot space with a ton of momentum that happens to have achieved that because of the nature of the open source project that the companies are being built around. Interesting, interesting. I mean, uh, at Platform, you're, you're riding the, you know, you mentioned several open source projects in your inter introduction. Uh, uh, at Platform Mine, was that a, a useful thing for you going out and raising money and pitching you, your business? You know, the tricky thing with this question is that my investors, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. You are in the worst possible. <laughs> so you're putting me on the That's spot. That's okay. Gary is going to talk <laughs> his Gary, book all if you morning. If you can tune out for a little <laughs> you bit. Have a pen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think that uh, fundraising is like a sale. Uh, and as a salesperson, the CEO is essentially, the entrepreneur is essentially trying to make a sale. And I think as a salesperson, you want to control every aspect of the conversation. And the whole open source thing can really get in the way of that. Um, we didn't start the company, by the way. I, this platform line thing is my first uh, thing with open source. It's my first and last startup. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we were, I was at VMware with Jocelyn. Uh, she was, I was a lowly engineer. She was a big shot, so she doesn't know me from there. <laughs> but the thing is, like, we, didn't, we didn't come from an open source background. We, we wanted to make clouds easier to run. And when we started with that, we said, why would we go and retool all the stuff that OpenStack has done and all the stuff that containers are going to do uh, so we said, that makes no sense. We want to solve the core operational challenge, the challenge that Subhu talked about earlier, which is operating clouds is hard. And it doesn't matter whether you use closed source or, or open source. That operational challenge is what we do as a company. And so I think you know, it was really interesting for me. There was this project, OpenStack, that everybody be likes to believe is dead, except that everybody's running VMs everywhere you look. Right. <laughs> uh, and Not this dead. Kubernetes thing is white hot, except yeah. that there's no one using it at scale. I mean, right. I'd love to see Ticketmaster stats, but I'm willing to bet more than 90% of their workloads are running on VMs. So The best part about this event is you can get that info. Just pull them I'm, I'm going to catch <laughs> Justin after. So my, my point is that like, I think it gets in the way. You know, you, uh, at least my perspective is our value proposition, yes, open source is a core part of our value proposition, proposition to the customer, but from a financing perspective, you know, timing is everything, and there's winds blowing. You know, there's a crosswind on OpenStack, there's a tailwind on Kubernetes, serverless is white hot. Who wants that? Well, I, I happen to be a fan of Kubernetes myself, but. <laughs> but Kubernetes, is, my view, sorry, my view is Kubernetes is the next OpenStack. Two years from now, it's going to be, somebody's going to be beating no, up I, on it. We'll be hard about something else. So. I, I totally agree. In fact, I was at a venture event one day, and, and someone, they came up, a, a partner came up to me and said, you know, we uh, create value at, at our firm, and, you know, that's what we work with open source. What does the Linux Foundation do? And I replied, well, we destroy value. <laughs> 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 No, I'm kidding. I, you know, again, I, I really believe in, in what Jake's saying, which is if you don't have a commercial feedback loop here, these things aren't sustainable. And you get an open SSL or you get uh, an NTPD or an open SSL where there's you know, one person maintaining this, this uh, open source just, project. Just as a, uh, the investor side of that, we found Platform 9 when we were looking at opportunities in Kubernetes and serverless. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, Edith, I want yeah. to go to you because you... It, are you sort of characterized as an open source company just because that's where the cloud is at, no, right? No, not at all. So first of all, I'm a little bit strange because I'm in the East Coast. And when you go into investor in the East Coast and they're in open source, they don't even understand what you're talking about. They're really kind of like, what? And, and I make it more than a challenge just because I'm a solo founder 
in the East Coast and a woman. So that wasn't very, very easy for me to, <laughs> to get there. You should move out. Like, uh, that's what everybody's saying. Wine country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So that's that. I mean, the reason I just, first of all, that wasn't my, like what I'm doing right now is not my first project. I was a CEO, a CTO in the EMC Cloud Management Division. We right. opened source a project that was relatively successful. Right. Um, and then when I started this company, for my opinion, this is, to be fair, the only way, and I'll explain what I mean. I mean, there's a lot of good engineers out there, a lot. But I believe that there's not a lot of innovators. I mean, there is innovators, but not a lot. They are like not that common. Mm. And I believe that once the IP is out there, then everybody can go and build it. Because that's not that hard, at least not for my team, for instance. I right. can build everything that is out there. Right. So for me, once I'm already saying the IP, here's what I'm going to do, if I'm not going to open source it, someone else will go and do it. And guess what? It will be more popular than me. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that I have a choice. And, and not like other who think that the way to make money from their opinion is actually to make, uh, you, know, money to, you know, I don't know, services, so we will not open source everything. I actually think that the way to be better is just innovating constantly. If yeah. you're looking at a company like Apple, for instance, there was like just before the fire, uh, uh, they let um, Steve Jobs go. Basically, the fight there inside was that Steve Jobs was con constantly wanted to continue innovating, but the other wanted to do the Apple II, right? Yeah. So I believe in Steve, right? I believe in his way, and I think that what I'm planning to do there is just a we just open source a project. We already are six months ahead of it, right? And basically, what we continue going to do is we're going to continue putting innovation on. Uh, we want to lead this market. We don't want to, you know, we want to come with the idea and lead the direction. And I believe that we will see what will happen. I'm optimistic. Yeah, I, I, I love the way you describe that because, you know, I always talk from, from the open source project side as, hey, these projects are simply raising the innovation ball. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this is stuff that's sort of continually pushing things right. commodity, but to, to essentially monetize, you better get high up the bar. Yeah. On, on, on the investor side, and then I'm going to come back to you. You know, what are you seeing in terms of, is that innovation bar driving? But then more, as an investor, where do you look at the line there? Where, do, you, do you have an investment thesis on, man, if you're not adding value above this particular area, I'm not even interested in looking at you as a company. Um, boy, I mean, I'd love to say there's like a, a specific quantity or unit of measure, and it's and it's way more art than science. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree actually with what you're saying, and I also want to tie this back to something that Jake said earlier, which is that, and I think collectively the panel said earlier, which is the beauty of open source from an investor's perspective is is distribution, not innovation, right? Is is contribution to to marketing, not to R and D, and I. Wish I could cite this quote, but it's I, I, I don't know who said it, but um, but it's so great I have to share the thought anyway, which is it's something like, look, startups are in a race with big companies. Startups have innovation, big companies have distribution. And you're in a race to get distribution before the big company can get innovation, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I think that in, in open source, in, you it, it gives you such a leg up on the distribution side mm -hmm. that it's almost, it's, 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 you know, especially on the infrastructure side, I think it is de facto mandatory. I mean, I invest in a lot of very early stage companies where we're the first institutional money in. You're talking to any infrastructure startup, and one of the debates they're having early on is, should we open source or should we not? And, um, and so getting back around to the question you asked me, like the debate is also <coughs> what to open source, like yeah. where to draw the line on what is free and what you hold back and try to monetize. And I would say the crucial principle for me in those conversations, I'm not really wearing my investor hat, I'm kind of wearing my entrepreneur and operator hat because I'm just trying to think of what will make the business the most successful it can be. And, um, and in those conversations, to me, the crucial principle is, um, is backlash. Are you giving something crippled? Are you giving something that is like a, you know, a, a, a toy that like maybe is useful to, and, and I think that, that if, if developers, I mean, I, I just think, you know, developers are not, you know, children, they're not dummies, right? And if you call something open source, but it's really trivial, and the only way to get the full functionality or do anything outside of a demo with it is is to um, is to pay. Then that's I don't think going to have the, the currency. The the you know nobody's going to get wildly excited about contributing to that or sharing it or, or building a community around it. So I think what's what's crucial is that you have something that feels, for all intents and purposes, really full featured, really valuable, really nails my problem. Especially if I'm working on my own or I'm doing research or I'm doing something as a, as a hobbyist. And the only time it sort of feels, but, but that those enterprise features, then you're worried about competing with yourself, 
right, that the free thing is good enough. And so what's crucial is to have an enterprise feature set where if somebody's really running this at immense scale, if somebody's really making a ton of money off of it, by God, I've got to have the features that are there in the enterprise edition. And that's, I, I wish there was a silver bullet you know, if there was like a clearly identifiable set of features, but it's just so dependent on a project by project basis. But the ones that, that find that way to thread that needle where it feels so full featured for the hobbyist or the solo project, but so essential <laughs> to pay for the enterprise edition if you want commercial scale, um, if, you, if you find that, I think you've got it. Erica, you, you, you know, it seems like you do a lot of work on making that operational efficiency uh, really, you know, provide huge value. Mm -hmm. What bring us into some of the debates internally at Bitnami about like where this line is? Where's the innovation bar? What do we, uh, you know, how do you think about that? It's, I mean, so Bitnami is interesting because most of what we do at the core of Bitnami is actually not open source, right? We build value around open source, and the company has bootstrapped itself uh, to the point we're at by packaging and delivering this open source. It's kind of like the, almost like the Red Hat model for applications that we're more focused on kind of hardening <coughs> and delivering something that will run out of the box. Mm. So that's been very clear, but we did just launch our first uh, commercial product last week, which is direct to the enterprise, which is a productization of our tooling so that others can package up their apps for all of these, uh, the different platforms that Bitnami supports. And there's been a lot of talk around which pieces of that will be open source and which won't. And right now, it's completely proprietary. Mm -hmm. And that's because, um, going to what Jocelyn said, I think it is really key to provide value, and we see ourselves in providing value in the assets that we generate out of Bitnami. And so we've separated kind of where we're monetizing uh, the business from like we're delivering a ton of value and the tooling for now is proprietary. Now over time we may open source that, but one of the things that I wanted to say is you can also go too far. Like there are plenty of companies that have given away everything and at the risk of getting tomatoes thrown at me, like Docker I think is a good example of this, right? They, there's a lot of things you could say about Docker, but they gave away so much initially without a clear business model and I think now the company is, is starting to build a business around it, but it took a lot longer than planned and that's because I think you need to be very thoughtful about how much you do open source. And once you go open source, it's pretty hard to go back. And I mean, look at yeah. Sugar CRM having to go through that. Sure. It's not an easy process. Sure. I mean, I think it, I mean, certainly there was a lot of marketing efficiency in Docker, though. We will give them uh, full mm -hmm. credit on that. I mean, uh, the, you do a Google Trends search on Docker, and it's, uh, it's pretty Oh, absolutely. Rashmi, I want to talk to you about sort of the mindset of a strategic venture firm in Microsoft. How, are you looking at specific technologies and then trying to invest around that? Like, what, what, how do you come up with your investment thesis? Yeah, so we typically try and stay, um, I want to say at least five years ahead of what the product teams are building internally. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit of being uh, part of this newly founded investment team at Microsoft is we're not strategic. So we don't require a business unit approval to do a deal. Oh, although we do check for alignment with Microsoft down the line, which may not happen, happen immediately, but maybe down the line. When it comes to open source, there's definitely, I would say, in the new Microsoft world, there's a ton of interest and excitement about what else can we do in the open source world. So I'm pretty stoked that Microsoft is the number one contributor um, in open source projects. We have about 12,000 or 15,000 um, open source committers. Mm -hmm. There's 24 projects across a variety of different ways, all the way from Linux kernel to dot, .NET Core to um, Kubernetes and Docker and a, a variety of different projects internally. So when we come um, at our investment thesis and what would be areas that would be interesting, it's really anywhere up and down, all the way from infrastructure to databases to analytics to um, enterprise applications. So we look at the entire stack. Yeah. Um, what we're really looking for are companies that, going back to what Jocelyn and Jake were saying, it's companies that can really produce a differentiated offering. It's not just doing open source for the sake of doing open source, but what really can drive a lot of community engagement around it? What can you build a solid monetization model around it? And more importantly, how are you going to make sure that you don't get killed by the next AWS announcement and reinvent saying they're satisfying this <laughs> offering and now your, your company is just dead. So um, those, those would be the, the three key points and just like any other financial investor, we care about financial returns. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of value that we can provide to these companies through 
all of Microsoft assets and the excitement that we have internally for open source. I, I, I can't help but riff on that question, uh, and I'm going to eat it. Do you live in fear of uh, your company becoming a, a AWS feature? <laughs> like, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, there is a lot of company. There's two things that I that I notice. One of them is there's there's a lot of company who really seek to be partnership with Amazon, and I just don't get it because they never bought a company. What they're doing, they're going closer to the companies, and they're basically <laughs> killing them. So that's really kind of like strange strategic that I see people doing. Uh, the second thing is that I'm not because uh, what I'm offering is always I would up, right? They will never do that, right? Their motivation is to stay in the cloud. I, I don't care, right? I mean, I, I, I want to go to Microsoft. I want to go to Google. I want to do this right. on-prem stuff, and they will never will, right? So this is, will always be my advantage. And I'm always working on layer seven on the stack, right. which means that they cannot take anything from me. Right. You know what I mean? So they cannot block that, right? I'm yeah, a yeah. user on their infrastructure. Like, so all of this together make me feel very, very solid. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned, you know, how they don't do, at least Amazon, you don't see a lot of m and activity, but I want to go to uh, Gary and, and Jake here uh, on, you know, you, you expect some outcomes here. You know, you want a liquidity event at some point. Are you seeing any particular trends in terms of more m and activity, more, you know, public market activity, you know, relative to these so open source centric type companies, or are we just beyond that at this point with uh, the, the firms that we see you know, going into the public markets these days? It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. It, it's interesting, once the companies get at scale, uh, most of our CEOs don't publicly describe themselves as open source companies because mm -hmm. um, hmm. they want to operate as a layer that conveys more strict, that they're not focused on as a tool but um, providing value at a, at a, at a higher level. Um, and they also want to be, um, again, not something that's cheaper, but something that is future-proofed um, and better than um, what all the alternatives are in the marketplace. So I think they really are um, describing value uh, and momentum and ASPs and reten net retention. That's what they're selling at, um, as opposed to positioning themselves as open source companies. Yeah. Jake, it sounds like you're seeing similar things, or? Yeah, I, I mean, and I, and I like the fact that these companies aren't necessarily leading with the, this sort of development model open source, right? They're, if you're gonna go public, just lead with the metrics, and if you have 80% gross margin, you're gonna get valued like a traditional enterprise software company, and if you, you know, have a 25% margin, you're gonna be valued as, as something else. I, I think we've certainly seen over the past year and a half, and looking forward to the next year, a rise in uh, the IPOs uh, that are fundamentally open source companies. I think we've seen a small uptick in, in buys of medium scale uh, open source companies, and including some you know pretty recent transactions. Um, I, I think you know the rest of the world is getting more comfortable. I do still think there's still some holdouts. I do think there are still some large corporate entities that are still scratching their head a little bit, and they're like, wait, what are we buying? Like, aren't all the contributors just going to leave after we buy them? And maybe they don't have the right. Um, culture or processes uh, in place uh, to take advantage of them, and that's not gone. Um, but mm. that, is, that is certainly uh, declining. Um, and then you know, the, other, the other mega trend that I, I think we're seeing is, is this, this great concern uh, relative to the cloud vendors, and, and no disrespect, and we'll leave Linux out, but like, it, it's, not the, it's not the old world guys. They're not worried about, like, hey, is, like, is IBM going to come take our, our, our lunch? That's not what these startups are, are worried about. It's like very specifically the, the big three you know, like newer cloud providers, and um, that's forcing a lot, of, lot more thought to go into the business models of these companies a lot sooner. Interesting, interesting. What, one of the questions we asked earlier in the week is, how, what, how can an open source project be a super good upstream to your downstream monetization models? And I'll throw this both to the investors and to the entrepreneurs in terms of what do you really look for there? You look for sourcing? Do you look for a huge momentous trend? Are you looking at a particular technology value? What, do you, what, what makes for a super good upstream open source project in terms of that downstream monetization? I'll, I'll throw it to anyone, it, both so, on the investment. I think that first of all, I need to look at the code and see how good it is really, because that's the foundation, so I have to make sure that it is solid, and not all the open source projects are solid. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. see that the use cases make sense to what I want to build. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, trending, I mean, to be fair, I want to piggyback on the others, right? It's really actually really good for me. Right. So. Yeah, so piggybacking on the, tr I mean, 
starts with good code, does it solve some kind of problem? That's the most important. And right. I think, by the way, that open source, that for, for my opinion, this is great that we're putting the, open, the project out there. And can I give you an example of something that we wanted to do in my company, and one of my engineers basically offer a hack, and I said to him, that will never happen. We're putting it out there. Everybody will see that it's on yeah. the door. So I think that, at least for me, what is important is to put a killer, mm. very, very good code out there, because that's my branding of my company. If someone will look at it and say, this is maybe a nice idea, but the implementation is not good, they will never buy it, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, go look at my product. <laughs> yeah, very, very yeah. solid code, and, and I'm very, like, every line there I'm going over, because yeah. I'm not, it's my name out there, right? Yeah, Erica, how about you? I would add to that in addition to good code, like good governance, and I'm obviously biased, um, but you know, being a part of a foundation with a very clear set of directions and goals, like I think that's part of the reason that Kubernetes has been so successful in addition to being like a very interesting and innovative technology. It's the governance around Kubernetes and the way that uh, Google put it into the foundation and now a community has been built around it. Like you don't want to build a business around something where you don't have some degree of certainty of the longevity of the project and yep. the momentum of the project. And it's really hard to get that if it's just coming out of say a, a company that might have ulterior motives, right? Yeah, yeah, good, good point. So I'm hearing, you know, uh, obviously it starts all with the code and, and the innovation there, uh, governance, the ecosystem, the piggybacking off of that, that big momentum trend that's sort of just starting. What else? Any, anybody else? Go, go ahead. Gonna, go, go ahead. ahead. Sure. You know, one, one point I'd say is also about value innovation. I think the days when open source was a way to do 20% of uh, the price, 80% of the value, you know, Kubernetes is an example of a project which, you know, in some ways you could use it as an alternative to some existing traditional technologies, but in many ways it's actually, I think Justin said this, right? They were looking at this as a way to build better software. And it was not a cheaper VMware, you know. So I think that to me is opening up a new market. It's, it's about creating. Trend. Ultimately, all of us investors, entrepreneurs together, are we creating? Are we moving the the world forward? Right. I, mean, I view that as a key aspect of any significant open source project because ultimately it's about creating economic value for the world. Hmm. The only one thing I would add is just making sure that we um, or our portfolio companies read the fine print on the licensing models. Mm. Ah, because there's just so many different varieties in how the licensing models work. So does it mean that if you use the open source project, um, the portion of what you're using it for kind of becomes open source too? Like, do you keep, get to keep that IP? Yeah. Um, or is there any um, inherent data sharing that just becomes applicable as part of using that open source. So it's just reading that fine print and making sure that we completely understand what we're getting into. Yeah. And I, I think maybe the simple observation is sort of what is, what is your fundamental unfair advantage in terms of how you take advantage of this open source project? Like at the end of the day, it is an open source project, right? Yeah. So anyone can have a relationship with it. Like what is your role in the governance, in the creation of the product, in your company's stature or situation that's going to uh, actually allow you to be one of the one to three companies that can really draft off the project and and you know I, I think it, it's great for various consulting practices and in other types of businesses to build a publicly traded company you have to really articulate that and there's a lots of there's you know there's how, how many kubernetes related companies do we actually need at the end of the day I think there's room for one to three um, do we need do we need 30 Kubernetes companies? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to, I mean, certainly at least a couple of those are going to be really big, is, is the point, right? Yeah. That I think, you know, this is the riding the coattails and so forth. I want to come back to this. Can I just, uh, just Go start. ahead, Gary. Um, I, w I would encourage everybody to be very creative about how to monetize upstream. So certainly open source gives you market leadership. You can start from nothing and become a market leader pretty quickly. Um, and I think of open source as, as a freemium business model. And it, has, it also gives you a mindset of B2C, which you have to automate everything because you don't want people calling you because <laughs> they aren't paying you. So you actually build up some pretty good practices to make yourself operationally very efficient. But then you've got to figure out how to monetize it. And I'll just give you one example. We have a co-investment with Excel in a company called Sonatype. Uh, it is the Maven open source project for software build management. And it you know, has all the same issues of competing against the free version. But uh, we recruited in a CEO that used to be the CEO of Sourcefire, he had a security background, and he said, hey, all these components that are, per, per the last uh, panel, all these components coming into a, a company can be scanned, and you can figure out what their pedigree is and what quality and the data. 
also whether there's known security flaws, we will create the equivalent of a um, component firewall for large banks and retail companies and the like and, and figure out what components are allowed in, uh, gold, gold and mastered, and what servers, what applications they are throughout the whole organization. And all of a sudden now, it is a uh, runtime operational DevOps, SecOps, but also a CSO solution that took it from the 25K ASP to a six figure and some seven figure um, deals. So who would have thought of monetizing it for security? So think about your projects. Are there other ways you can add value to an organization based on the real estate you have in with your, with your product offering? Last question for the group, and, and we just go down the line here, is consistently this week, whether it was the Home Depot folks saying, we like open source, PS we're hiring. Mm -hmm. the, the theme I'm hearing all week is talent is crucial. Mm -hmm. Just this is such a big deal. Does this open source trend here, is, how critical that is that to your talent strategy, to bringing in, you know, we did a little analysis of, of some open source projects. It's, it's sort of in mid-flight right now, <clears throat> where you know, for a huge group of projects, two, three percent of the developers are doing 70, 80 percent mm -hmm. of the code here. This is sort of, you know, your point. These true innovators in there are, are, are really rarefied. Mm -hmm. How does this play into your, your whole strategy here? Does open source move that needle? Yeah, so before our serverless project, we had only packaged existing open source projects and delivered that as a SaaS service. Uh, but with a serverless project, uh, it was extremely well received. Uh, and we had 48, uh, right now there's 48 active contributors, 10% of, uh, of whom, five of whom are now employees of Platform 9. Mm -hmm. And these are the only employees of Platform 9 who are not based out of Sunnyvale. One is based out of Taiwan. Interesting. One is based out of Netherlands, was a PhD student doing workflow composition. In P so really good domain knowledge and expertise that's directly relevant to the project would have been impossible to hire. But they found us. There's no recruiting costs. And so motivated. So I think that it is a fundamentally different ballgame. It, it I think open source completely raises the bar in terms of the kind of talent you can attract, their motivation to the cause, and their, talent, their capability. Yes. Interesting. Big believer. Interesting. Interesting. Erica, are you seeing the same thing? At, at yeah, the absolutely. And in, in Kubernetes, too, we also have a serverless project, Kubeless, and we've attracted quite a bit of our talent through all of the open source projects that we have ongoing. And also, this commercial product is based on and runs on top of Kubernetes. And um, like Sarish, we've started hiring people all over the world. And somebody asked me, like, why have you gone into so many countries to hire people? Where there aren't that many people who are spectacularly good at Kubernetes yet, and it gives us a competitive advantage to be able to hire them wherever they are when some companies want you in office. So, absolutely. Yeah, there are a few of them in this room. But <laughs> Ida, how about you? Yeah, so, so, so for me, again, it's different. I'm in Boston. Uh, so we have a lot of university, but people that don't like startup, they're much more kind of like solid in the VMware, Google of the world. Mm. So for, for me, this is exactly what happened. Once we start open source a project, suddenly talent come to us. But before that, they weren't feel comfortable to do that. Once projects succeed, people want to come. Uh, and it's fantastic, as I said, I see a huge advantage of being in Boston, actually, even though I'm <laughs> sounds, because there is all those university and great people. We just need to attract right. them. I can, I can give a little bit of the big company perspective on this, which is um, certainly at VMware, open source projects were one of our favorite ways to recruit because you can actually identify people by their work and mm -hmm. you can find people who are specialists based on the actual work that they've done. Um, and, and we needed some people doing some pretty specialized things. It was, it was pretty hard to find. And then, you know, Facebook, I would say, went even farther. And, you know, as much as there were individuals within Facebook who were absolutely passionate believers, true believers in open source and had the desire um, to open source what they were working on, and, and Facebook has contributed many great projects to the world, I have to say that the business motivation for Facebook to do it was absolutely hands down recruiting. Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. in, in releasing those projects, we were able to build our engineering brand, we were able to attract people who would not have come to a, a company where the only thing they would do was proprietary. Um, and so, you know, if, if you think about it, you know, Cassandra, Hive, you know, those, those projects owe their existence to Facebook's bottomless desire to hire more engineers. <laughs> I, I'll take it. Right? <laughs> Jake, I want to go to you, then Rashmi, I'll give you the last word. I, I think all these comments are, are great. I'd also point out, like, I, I think on the buy side, there's also, you know, a huge desire. Uh, a lot of people want to right. develop their skill set. They gravitate uh, to 
you know, working with open source projects in, in, in the vast majority of the time that's positive, uh, you know, maybe to say something a little anathema. At, at some point, some people maybe over-rotate, right? And they're so enamored with open source, they're like, oh, wait a minute, like, is this actually the best thing to solve my problems? Um, you know, that's more the, the exception than the rule, but it creates this groundswell of adoption, and then, the, you know, the fundamental outcome of that is, um, to just dive back something we talked about at the beginning, it's a, you walk into the CIO after the, the you know these open source projects are here, and like of course I want to talk to you because you know it's already deployed. All my engineers are telling me all about it. Um, what like the first time you you say hello to them? What proprietary software company? Like you knock on the CIO's door and it's like go talk to someone three layers yeah, down, brutal. right? And so uh, it, it has a tremendous benefit on, on the buy side in terms of the interactions. Yeah, too. absolutely. Rashmi, last word. Yeah, for us as well, I mean, it's definitely um, the caliber of talent that we can attract as part of recruiting. So when we acquired Deus, um, Gabe and his entire team stayed on board. Um, we got Brendan Burns, who is the chief architect of Kubernetes, to join us, and that was a big moment of celebration for yeah. everyone in-house. Uh, but keeping and retaining those people is incredibly important as well. So um, I do agree that it's great from a recruiting standpoint, but yeah. I don't think that it would be cheap to continue to keep these people on board because obviously there's so many interesting projects and so many interesting companies that they can go to and how do you yeah. motivate and retain the set of people is going to be top of mind for any company, be it startup or a big company that has these people. Yeah. You heard it from Rashmi. Uh, some of you in this room are greatly underestimating your fair market value. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I want to thank all of you for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I want to quick do a save the date, March 12th to 14th uh, at the Ritz-Carlton Half Moon Bay. We're going to do it again next year. Uh, thank you all. We've got sessions uh, throughout the afternoon. Enjoy wine country. The sun came out. Uh, and thanks for coming.